Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Tevedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering, IIT Guwahati. And what we were discussing, we were discussing about the different properties of the enzyme in the course Enzyme Science and Technology. So far what we have discussed, we have discussed about the uh, development of the history of the enzyme, uh, history of the enzymology. Then subsequent to that in the module 2, we have discussed about the structure of the enzyme. So, uh, while we were discussing about the structure of the enzyme, we discussed about the primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure and quaternary structures. And we have discussed uh, several techniques which you can actually be able to use for, uh, you know, uh, determining the uh, these structures of the enzyme. Uh, in the previous module, we have discussed about how you can be able to isolate a gene from the, uh, from the, from the genome. Uh, whether you are aware of the genome, genomic sequences or whether you are unaware of the genomic sequences, you can be able to use multiple approaches to isolate the gene of your interest, which is going to code for the enzyme of your interest. And then once you have got the uh, fragment, we have also discussed in the previous lecture how you can be able to clone that fragment into the vector of your choice. Now, once you have uh, clone the uh, fragment of your choice into the uh, into the vector the vector has to be delivered into the suitable host so in the today's lecture we are going to discuss about the various strategies what you can actually be able to use for delivering the dna into the suitable host so uh, what you can see is this is the scheme for enzyme production, right? And in this scheme, uh, we have already discussed uh, many aspects of this scheme where we have said that the, you are going to isolate the gene fragment from genome, right? Either you are aware of the genomic sequences or you are unaware of the genomic sequences. This means either you will use the genomic library approach or the cDNA approach or you are going to use the PCR. Once you have these genomic sequences, then you are going to perform the restriction digestion of this particular sequence and that is how you are going to get the sticky ends. Same you are going to do for the vectors, right. In this case, we have taken an example of the plasmid, which is the bacterial vector. And then uh, you are going to put the restriction digestion and you are going to have the sticky ends of the plasmid. Then you are going to put them for the ligation reaction and that is how you are going to get the recombinant clone. This recombinant clone is has to be delivered into the suitable host so that you can be able to use that for protein production. So, uh, when we talk about the DNA delivery in host, we have to understand the many aspects of this particular process. So, DNA delivery in host, so you can imagine that how the people have discovered or how the people have get to know about the DNA delivery in host. So, you can imagine that you have a donor cell from which you are actually going to have the, uh, you know, the DNA molecules and these DNA molecules are, you know, that the negatively charged. So, these DNA, the charge on the DNA is negative charge on the DNA molecule interacts with the host cell, especially with the cell surface, which means if I change the cell surface chemistry of this donor cell in such a way that it is actually going to take up these DNA and they will go and, you know, stick to this particular, uh, you know, cell wall or the plasma membrane, they will be going to taken up by the cell. So, the surface chemistry of the host cell, the surf host cell surface chemistry either will attract or the repel DNA as a result of the opposite or the similar charges, which means the uh, cell surface of the host is either going to be positively charged or the negatively charged. If it is positively charged, it is actually going to attract the DNA. If it is negatively charged, it is going to repel the DNA. So, presence of the cell wall in case of bacteria or fungus or the plant causes the additional physical barrier to the cellular uptake and the cellular entry. So, actually the entry of the DNA is not a facilitated process. It has, it has multiple barriers and multiple hurdles and all these hurdles has to be overcome by preparing a competent cell. So, what is mean by the competent cell is the cell which is actually going to be readily be taken up the uh, so, which is readily going to take up the recombinant DNA, okay. And you are supposed to prepare their competent cells, which means you are not, 
uh, wild type cells are not competent enough they are not going to take up the dna but you can actually be able to uh, you know treat them in such a way that it's going to change the surface chemistry of the uh, cell surface and that's how it is actually going to take up the cells uh, naturally uh, the this process is called as the transformation which means the process in which the dna fragment from the one cell is going to be taken up by the other cell so you can imagine that if the donor cell is resistant for the antibiotic for example you have taken an antibiotic and uh, that is been you know some some bacteria cells are actually acquiring the resistance for that but antibiotic cells uh, by many means because of some presence of some DNA, right? So if you have a presence of DNA which is responsible for providing the antibiotic resistance, this particular donor cell is actually going to be overcome or it is actually going to be overcome from the antibiotic mediated killing. So in that case, it, what it will do is it will actually going to throw this particular DNA and this DNA is going to be very, very valuable for the other bacterial uh, uh, members right so what they will do is they will going to accept by the other cell right and as soon as the other cell is going to take up this dna it is actually going to also acquire the resistance and this is actually the pro way in which the transformation is actually going to be uh, you know going to uh, help the single bacteria to acquire the resistance and also to spread the resistance throughout the colony how it happens uh, it happens that you are actually going to have the donor cell. From the donor cell, the, these, um, the donor DNA or the DNA fragment, which is actually going to have the uh, antibiotic resistance genes or any kind of phenotypic gene is actually going to put into the extracellular media. And then ex this extracellular media is actually going to interact with the acceptor cells. So you are going to have the competent recipient cells so that donor DNA fragment will bind to the competent recipient cells and that's how it is actually going to be taken up. So mechanism of transformation is the process by which the cell free DNA is taken up by the another bacteria. The DNA from the donor bacteria binds to the competent recipient cells and DNA enters into the cell. The DNA enters into the recipient cell through an uncharacterized mechanism. The DNA is integrated into the chromosomal DNA through a homologous recombinations. Naturally, transformation is common between the closely related species, which means there are, uh, you know, so natural transformation, we have already taken an example where the, you can actually be able to use that for transferring the resistance from the resistance or the phenotype from the one cell, uh, one bacterial population to another bacterial population. But the in the lab what you are going to do is you are going to add the excess chromosomal dna or you are going to add the recombinant clone uh, recombinant dna and in presence and uh, when you add this recombinant dna to the competent recipient cells the, the dna is actually going to interact with the competent recipient cells and that's how it is actually going to taken up by the cell and once it is going to taken up by the cell it is actually going to go for cell division and that's how you're going to have the transformed cells. So where the copy is on the both side of the DNA. Sometimes you are actually going to have the integration sites on these DNA so they will integrate into the genome. Otherwise they will remain as the extra chromosomal DNA in the form of the plasmids. Now how are you going to prepare the competent cells for your laboratory experiments? Uh, depending on the bacterial species, you can be able to use the different types of chemical reagents which are actually going to change the surface chemistry and will make the cell competent so that they will take up the new cell. They will take up the, uh, the extracellular DNA. So for example, in the case of Stetophocus pneumonia, you are going to treat the cells with the mitomycin C or fluoroquinol. So when you treat the cells with mitomycin C or fluoroquinol, they are going to be competent and they will actually going to take up the extracellular DNA. Similarly, you have the bacillus subtilis, you are going to treat the cells with the UV light and that actually is going to induce or that is going to change the surface chemistry and that's how it is actually going to be competent cells. In the case of helicobacter pylori, the bacteria which is responsible for the ulcer, right, uh, or is going to be treated with the ciprofloxacin, ciprofloxacin is an antibiotic, okay. So the treatments are different because your surface chemistry is going to be different, the physiology of that particular bacteria is going to be different. 
So that's why you are actually going to treat it with the different uh, competent agents. Then we have the Ligonophila pneumophila. Then that is actually going to be made the competent by treating it with the mitomycin C, norfoxacin, ofloxacin, and all these kind of antibiotics and hydroxyurea and as well as uvulite. For example, E. coli, which is the, called as laboratory strain. So this is the lab strain and uh, that can be competent by treating with the covalent chemicals like the calcium chloride and rubidium chloride. And uh, the cells are how you're going to make the competent cells. So you're going to treat the cells with the different agents. So all of these agents. So just for sake of how we can be able to make the competent cells, I am giving you an example of the E. coli cells. So we, in, the, in the E. coli cells, we are going to take an example of how you can be able to use the calcium chloride to prepare the uh, E. coli competent cells. So preparation of the competent cells. So bacteria is incubated with the divalent cation like the calcium chloride, manganese chloride or the rubidium chloride for 30 minutes at 4 degrees Celsius. First, you are going to grow the bacteria and then your bacteria is going to incubate it with a divalent cation such as calcium chloride, magnesium chloride or rubidium chloride for 30 minutes at 4 degrees Celsius. What will happen in this period? During this process, the cell wall of the treated bacteria is going to swell and it gathers the factor required for the intake of the DNA docked onto the plasma membrane. Uh, so you can imagine that when you are doing all this preparation, it is actually going to take up the calcium chloride or the divalent cations. And these divalent cations, they were, what they are going to do is they are actually going to take, uh, they are going to make the cells a uh, little fragile. Okay, so in that case, you might have to take care of these cells very nicely because they are also get susceptible for any kind of shear stress. So shear stress is a, is means that you are actually going to suppose uh, when you are swimming into the air, water, right? The water, whatever the stress you will feel when the water is actually hitting you, that is called as a shear stress. Shear stress means you have two layers and these two layers are actually rubbing to each other and that is actually be responsible for causing a friction and that is actually a called as shear stress. So they are very susceptible for shear stress. For example, if you spin them a very high speed, uh, you probably will actually going to like the cells. So that's why these uh, competent cells are very fragile you cannot run that very high speeds okay and you also cannot do the pipetting at a very uh, high pipetting right for example if you do a pipetting a lot of you know with the thin bore uh, tips uh, it is actually going to uh, destroy the cell because it's going to lyse the cells uh, how you're going to store the competent cells you can uh, once your competent cell preparation is over then you can actually be able to add the 15 to 20 percent glycerol and you can store it at minus 80 degrees Celsius and whenever you require so 15 to 20 percent glycerol is actually going to work as anti-freezing agent right so it's not going to allow the formation of the water crystal and uh, that's how it is actually going to protect the bacteria from getting the any kind of damages uh, so you have to be very careful that the cells are very fragile, they are sensitive for the centrifugations and they are also sensitive for the pipetting. That's why you can, once you prepare the competent cells, you aliquot them in a, you know, in, into a suitable volume and uh, then you can just use the same, uh, that volume completely. You cannot just pipette it out and prepare the more aliquots. Uh, how you are going to prepare the competent cells? So uh, what you can do is first you are going to do grow the bacteria. Okay. So if you see the bacterial growth curve, what you are going to see is it has the lag phase, it is going to have lock phase, it has the stationary phase and it has the death phase or the decline phase. So the cells which are in the lock phase, stationary phase or the cells which are in the decline phase are actually under the extreme stress which means these three phase of the cell right whether you are under the lock phase or the stationary phase or the death phase are not suitable for preparing the competent cells. So you have to grow the bacteria in such a way that it should be in a lock phase you know in a, in a logarithmic phase so that they are very healthy they are actually acquiring the different types of factors and there is a no dearth of nutrition so there is no 
uh, loss of nutrition. So, they are actually going to have a lot of nutrition and they are actually having the ability to produce a lot of factors. So, that is actually going to be the best bacterial culture uh, what you are going to use. So, the growth stage of the bacteria has a significant impact for its ability to take up the foreign DNA. The bacteria at log phase is more active and efficient to perform the DNA damage and repair than the stationary phase. As a result, it is preferred to use a bacteria of log phase for making the competent cells for the transformation. So, once you grow the bacteria, bring it to the log phase and then you, uh, you know, collect the log phase bacteria and then you are going to use that for the competent cell preparation. So, how you are going to do the transformation? So, on the day of transformation, competent cells are incubated with the DNA or the circular plasmid containing appropriate resistance genes such as ampicillin resistant genes for the 30 minutes on ice. So, first you are, what you are going to do is, in the, this is the step one number one. So, in the step one, what you are going to do is, you are going to thaw the competent cells, right? Because remember that the competent cells are going to be stored at minus 80 degrees Celsius in the 15 to 20 percent glycerol, right? So, first what you are going to do is, you are going to thaw the cells and you are going to use that for transformations. Then in the step one, you are going to incubate the, uh, the DNA, either the linear DNA or the circular plasmid with in the ice, right? Along with the for 30 minutes. So, and then you are going to add the um, piscine resistance, okay. And then once this step is over, so you are going to have the 30 minutes incubation. And once the 30 minutes incubation is over, then you are going to give the heat shock. So, in the step 2, you are going to do a heat shock. So, competent cells are given a brief heat shock such as 42 degrees Celsius for 90 seconds to relax the cell wall and high temperatures thus causes upregulation of the factor responsible for DNA recombination and repair. So, then what you are going to do is you are going to give the heat shock. So, in the heat shock step what will happen is that because you are giving the heat shock, the cell is actually going to swell and it is actually going to take up the DNA into that. And because you are providing the heat shock, it also going to induce the production of the uh, cellular machinery which is responsible for DNA recombination and repair because that is very very important event because if the, even if the, it has taken up the DNA and it cannot actually be able to recover from the damages then the cell is actually going to die. Then in the next step what you are going to do is you are going to add once the heat shock is over right then you are going to add a chilled media and that is actually going to bring the rigidity of the cell wall or the plasma membrane and that is how it is actually going to seal the pores what is going to be prepared into the plasma membrane and that is how it is actually going to help in terms of the faster recovery of the transform cells. So, once you add the chilled uh, media you can actually allow them to recover for 30 to 45 minutes at 37 degrees Celsius and uh, after this recovery you are actually going to uh, uh, plate the cells onto the agarose uh, plates, right. So, after this uh, it is plated onto the solid media with the appropriate antibiotics such as ampicillin and allowed to grow for another 18 to 24 degrees Celsius here at 37 degrees Celsius incubator. So, when you are, are done with the you know chilled uh, media, you added the chilled media, you let them to uh, you know remain into the 37 for some time and then you are actually going to plate them onto the uh, agar, uh, LB ampicillin plate. So, for example, in this case we have taken the ampicillin resistance uh, gene. So, when you do the ampicillin uh, plating it is actually and then you incubate into the incubator for uh, six, uh, 18 to 24 hours then it is actually going to form the colonies and now these colonies are the transformed colonies which has taken up the DNA. Okay? the untransformed colonies will actually not going to have the ampicillin resistance and that is how they will actually going to die in this uh, LB ampicillin plate. So, transformed cells with appropriate resistance will grow and it will give you the colonies. So, once you are done with the transformations, uh, how, the, uh, how the bacterial plates will look like. So, this is actually the untransformed or the control plate okay, and this is your transformed plates. So, what you see here is I have we have transformed a 
plasmid into the LB ampicillin and uh, if you count the number of colonies it is 80 to 90 colonies what we got into this particular plate whereas there is no colony in the control plate which means the plate where we have not done any uh, plating we it only contains the, um, uh, the cells. So, this is without DNA and this actually has plus DNA ok. Now, using this in use this number right how many colonies you got you can be able to calculate the transformation efficiency. What is mean by transformation efficiency? The number of colony forming unit obtained by transforming 1 microgram of DNA into a given volume of competent cells ok. So, the number of colonies what you got from the 1 microgram of DNA is called as the transformation efficiency and it is a very very important parameter to judge how good your competent cells are because if they are very bad uh, you cannot use them for the uh, cloning reactions. Uh, for example, if you transformed the 1 microliter of 0 0.09 microgram per microliter plasmid into 100 microliter of competent cells, you added 900 microliter of LB to your cell to get a total reaction volume of 1000 microliter and then plated 100 microliter of the transformation, the plate has 450 colony on its next day which means uh, you have actually added the, this, much, this much amount of DNA and uh, this much amount was the reaction volume. So, what you are going to do is you are first going to calculate the amount of DNA what is you, you have used. So, if you calculate this you are what you are going to know is that you have plated 0 0.001 nanogram of DNA. Now, if you want to calculate the efficiency 450 colonies from 0 0.005 nanograms into 1000 because this is what the dilution you have done and that will actually going to tell you that you have a transformation efficiency that is 4.5 into 10 to the power 8. Uh, so, that is very good actually ok. So, 10 to power 8 is a very good efficiency uh, sometime you may get even more 10 to power 11 and so on. So, that will be going to very very good actually. So, any number which is above to 10 to power 4 or 5 is reasonably ok. Apart from the transformation by the chemical method you can also use you can also do the electroporation. So, electroporation is a method where you are going to use the electrical pulses into the cell. So, what will happen is that when you put the electrical pulses you are actually going to make the hole into the plasma membrane and utilize the and since the DNA is already out it is actually going to enter into the cell and that is how and after that you are going to put the chilled media and it is actually going to resell this uh, pore and that is how it is actually going to be taken up the DNA. So, the plasma membrane is composed of the lipid and protein. These macromolecule gives a partial conductance to the cell membrane. So, when a high electrical pulse is given to the cell, the charge run across the membrane and partially disturb the arrangement of the lipid molecule. As a result, it makes the formation of pore and allow easy passage of the macromolecule especially the charge molecule like DNA into the cell. After the electroporation, the cell is allowed to recover from the damage and it forms a colony on the selective solid media. So, you can see that this is a plasma membrane. So, plasma membrane is made up of, of the uh, lipids right. So, lipids are arranged like this right and lipids are partially been charged. So, when the past plasma when there is a very high pulse which goes on top of this, these lipid molecules are getting rearranged and because of that it actually allows the passage of the DNA into the cell and uh, this DNA is so this is actually very uh, momentarily. So, once you add the media this uh, pulse is going to be over and that is how it is actually going to seal this particular thing and uh, that is how the DNA is going to be delivered into the host and then later on you can actually allow the cells to recover and that is how you are going to have the uh, you are going to have the transformation done. The advantage of the electroporation is that it does not depend on the surface chemistry of the cell ok. It depends on the uh, so, so that is why it is very very robust compared to the chemical transformations. Uh, the disadvantage is that the electroporation is require a specialized instrument like the electroporator and it also requires the electro uh, cuvets. So, what are affecting uh, factors affecting the transformation efficiency, the plasmid size, then the form of DNA right. You can you, you know that when we were discussing about the plasmids 
uh, there are three different forms either the triple c forms oc forms and the supercoiled form okay so the transformation efficiency depends on the surface area of the molecule so surface area of the molecule the supercoiled is smaller right or smallest whereas the other two forms are actually having the larger surface area so that's why if you use the supercoiled dna the transformation is actually going to be very high compared to the closed circular DNA or the open circular DNA. Similarly, the plasmid size if you are working till 10 kb, uh, the transformation efficiency is going to be very high. Uh, but if you go beyond that, right, if you go be above to the 10 kb fra uh, fragments, the transformation efficiency is going to be very, very low. And in those cases, you might have to use the electroporation or the other methods. You cannot rely on the chemical methods. Then the genotype of the cell. Cloning strains, for example, E. coli K12 strain have 4 to 5 times the transformation efficiency of the similar strain. For linear DNA, which is poorly transformed in E. coli, the Rec B or Rec D mutation can significantly improve the efficiency of its transformation. Um, then the third is growth of the cell. So, log phase uh, cells are best for preparing the competent cells. Then the method of transformation, so we already have discussed that the chemical methods are actually going to give you the uh, less transformation efficiency compared to the uh, electroporations. And then we have to also have the damage. So exposure to the DNA to UV radiation is actually going to uh, be another factor which is all to affect the transformation efficiency. So, uh, we have we have prepared a small demo clip only to show you the different steps of the transformations and there the student have discussed the many aspects of the you know practical considerations which you can use or which you can consider while you are performing the transformations so uh, let me take you to my lab and they will actually going to show you a demo where they are going to show you how to transform the competent cells Myself, Suram Panish, research scholar at Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering at IIT Gaur. In this video, we will show you how to prepare competent cells and how to transform plasmid DNA. In addition to that, while preparing comp cells, we will show you what are the buffers we needed and how to prepare these comp cells step by step. And also, how to transform plasmid DNA using electroporation method. So let's learn how to do these things. Hello everyone. In this video, we will show you how to prepare competent cells and transform the plasmid and plate the cells. So let's start the procedure. Before, before preparing the comp cells, we need some inoculum this is the DH5 alpha inoculum. I am going to inoculate in a new vial for calm cells preparation. So I will show you how to inoculate. So now I am going to inoculate the culture. Then we will incubate in, in a shaking incubator to get 0.4. That is the dark phase of bacteria where we can prepare the calm cells. That is the good stage to transfer the plasma. After inoculation, now we have to keep it in incubator shaker till we get required OD. So it should be 37 degrees Celsius and 150 RPM.
now we can see some growth in here now we have to check what is the OD of this culture we can measure it in spectrophotometer at 600 nanometer now I have to take out 1 ml from this culture and blank against the media and then we will measure the objectives I am going to use spectrophotometer to measure what is the body of the uh, bacteria. Now, before doing that, I have to uh, plank against the media. So, this is the plain media. Now it is zero. So this is our uh, inoculated culture. I am going to use this sample holder. Then ask it for me. So the OD is 0.466. It is sufficient for our uh, capsules preparation. So we will use this culture for capsules preparation then transfer. So we got sufficient body. Uh, next we have to centrifuge the uh, culture and pellet down the cells. After that we will prepare capsules using fine for molar calcium. So I am going to uh, transfer into new centrifuge tube and centrifuge it together. Now I am going to centrifuge the culture at uh, 4000 rpm for 10 minutes. So in order to get the After mixing the competent uh, cell pellet with 0.1 molar calcium chloride, we have to keep the cell suspension for half an hour. Then in sub subsequent steps, 
with how to centrifuge and wash with the 0.1 molar calcium chloride for another two times. After final step, we have to add 0.1 molar calcium chloride, uh, 2 to 3 ml, resuspend gently and alcohol into Epindra tubes for storage. We have washed uh, in final step, so we have to mix uh, the cell pellet with the 0.1 molar calcium chloride, then we will import into a pendra tubes for storage. Allocated 100 ml microliter. Now we have to store these compressors in minus 80 degrees Celsius till further use. Any mechanical disturbances or freeze time will subsequently destroy the compressors. So there is no transformation. For preparing compressors, there must be some stepwise procedure which contains uh, checking the OD like what is the observance of the cell culture pillar uh, 0.4 to 0.5 uh, observance at 600 nanometer is preferable because at that point the cells are in exponential phase exponential phase cells are good for transfer transformation and we have to pellet down at 4000 rpm for 5 minutes the resulting pellet we resuspending 0.1 molar calcium chloride so we have to keep it on ice for uh, 30 minutes again we have to centrifuge remove the resulting calcium chloride uh, solution and add fresh calcium chloride solution again 5 ml again keep for 20 minutes and uh, centrifuge again whatever the resulting pellet you got we have to resuspend in 0.1 molar calcium chloride and aliquot into 1.5 ml epidra tubes so they can be stored at minus 80 degrees celsius for up to uh, 6 months uh, we have to add a plasmid in aseptic condition so uh, we kept this compressors and plasmid dna inside so now i am going to add plasmid We kept uh, the competent cells with plasmid DNA for 30 minutes on ice. Now we will give uh, heat shack at 42 degrees Celsius. We gave heat shock to the competent cells at 42 degrees Celsius and we have to keep 10 minutes on ice. Then we will add ERB media, cold ERB media uh, and uh, keep it in the incubator shaker. So I am going to add ERB media to the comp cells.
after adding media to the transformed cells, we will keep an incubator shaker at 37 degrees Celsius. with a rotation speed of 150 rpm. We just transformed the plasmid DNA into cells. But during this procedure, we have to be cautious because any mechanical disturbance to the cells will lead to decrease in transformation efficiency. So, while handling the cells, we are not going to keep outside like uh, normal temperature. Always we will keep comp cells on M ice. So otherwise uh, the transformation efficiency will go down. And uh, another thing is that we should not add plasmid in uh, normal environment. We have to always keep it in aseptic condition. And also uh, during uh, transformation. Uh, Now we got sufficient growth for transformation. We will centrifuge the cells and plate them suitably. After centrifugation, we will remove all the media but we will keep 100 microliter, resuspend the pellet and take 20 microliter and plate on agar plates. But if you are expecting low transformation efficiency, you can use all 100 microliter per plating. This is the best way to increase chances of transformation. We got a pellet. Now we will take out the media and keep 100 microliters, resuspend and we
we have plated the cells, we will keep in the incubator for overnight. Then we will observe what is the how many colonies. Now we can see there is a colonies appeared on the transformed plate like in but there is no colonies on uh, only comp cells plated one. So you can see colonies here. Now we will calculate the transformation efficiency. So there is a formula for transformation efficiency number of colonies you got on that plate and that microgram of DNA you used multiplied by final volumetric worry how much volume you recovered that is 100 microliter or based on your chest and how much volume plated so suppose you got 500 colonies on that plate you used 0 0.001 microgram of DNA into 100 microliter is total recovery but you plated only 20 microliter so that means you have 2500 divided by 0 0.001 so that will give 2.5 into 10 power 6 transformates per microgram of DNA in this video we showed you how to transform uh, plasmid DNA first of all we take a uh, 0.4 OD that is log phase bacteria uh, for uh, preparing comp cells then we prepared this capsules in 0.1 molar calcium chloride solution and washed and those compacted cells we used for the transformation and also for electroporation method we discussed what are the things need to be done like uh, what are the pulse uh, how much pulse we have to give and what time so all these things we discussed very nicely Hello, in previous video, we have shown that how to transform uh, plasmid DNA using calcium chloride method. In this one, we will show how to use a, an electroporator for transforming DNA. So this is the cuvette for uh, we use for electroporation. So there are two electrodes placed and this is the shock part. So, we will connect here like this and all the adjustments, pulse, how much time we have to give the pulse, all these things we can set here. So, once the setting is over, we can keep cells uh, along with our plasmid DNA inside and then hold and we will press pulse so whatever the pulse generated we have given the pulse that is generated inside and through the electrodes through the electrodes it will pass us through for a minute fraction of time because of this uh, electric pulse the pores of uh, there are small pores formed in bacteria if any plasmid adjacent to that uh, cell happens then it will enter inside the cell and quickly the pores are sealed those cells we will use for plating so this is all about the transformation of the e coli cells and i am sure you could have got the better practical experience of how to how to perform the competence cells and how to you know perform the transformations now let's move on to the next step and the next step is transformation in the yeast right so yeast is also another host which you can use for the overexpression purpose and uh, there are many methods which are available in the yeast the first method is lead acetate single standard dna peg method so in this method the yeast cells are incubated with a transformation mixture of the lithium acetate peg 3500 peg means polyethylene glycol
peg okay so peg is polyethylene glycol polyethylene glycol okay uh, single stranded carrier dna and the foreign dna or the foreign plasmid that is the recombinant dna at 42 degrees celsius for 40 minutes the purpose of adding the carrier DNA is to block the non-specific site on the cell wall and made the plasmid available for the uptake. Post transformation, the cells are pelleted to remove the transformation mixture and resuspended in 1 ml of water. It is plated onto a solid media with the appropriate selection pressure such as antibiotics. The second method is called as the spheroplast transformation method okay and spheroplast transformation method has multiple steps so in this method the yeast cell wall is removed partially to produce the spheroplast and that you are going to do with the help of the enzyme which is called as zymolase so spheroplasts are very fragile for osmotic shock but are competent to take up the free dna at a very high rate in addition the polyethylene glycol peg is used to facilitate the deposition of the plasmid and the carrier DNA on the cell wall for the easier uptake. So how you are going to perform the transformation of the yeast with the help of the spheroplast transformation method. So in the step 1, in the spheroplast method the yeast cells are incubated with the zymolase, the enzyme. So first you are going to grow the cells at log phase and uh, then the step 2 you are going to incubate the cells with the enzyme which is called as zymolase so what the zymolase is going to do is it is actually going to chew up the cell wall at a very discrete step okay so you if you are not going to do a complete hydrolysis or cup complete removal of the cell wall you are going to make the partial removal of the cell wall to produce the spheroplast so the species or the cell what is going to be generated once you have removed the partial cell wall, then it is called as spheroplast. Uh, okay. Now, what you are going to do is you are going to accept the uh, these spheroplasts are going to be collected by the centrifugation and incubated with the carrier DNA and the plasmid DNA for 10 minutes at room temperature. So, take the spheroplast, you collect the spheroplast by centrifugation and then you are incubating the spheroplast with the peg, the carrier DNA and as well as the recombinant plasmids. Then in the step 3, it is now treated with the peg and the calcium for 10 minutes with the gentle shaking. So you are going to you know keep the uh, cells like the spheroplast, the carrier DNA and plasmid and then you are slowly 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 you are going to add the peg and as well as the calcium the transformed spheroplasts are plated onto a selective solid media and incubated onto the 30 degrees celsius for 10 4 days because it, it takes uh, that much amount of time for getting the transformations so once you have got the uh, you know transformed spheroplast you are going to plate them onto a selective media and then you incubate that into a 30 degree Celsius incubator. Remember that the yeast is growing optimally in 30 degree compared to the 37 degree Celsius. And then you incubate that 4 days. After 4 days, you are going to get the plate with colonies and all these colonies are resistance for that particular antibiotic. So uh, this is all about these uh, the methods. Uh, the transformation methods what you can use to deliver the DNA into the bacteria or the yeast. Uh, in this particular lecture what we have discussed, we have discussed about how you can be able to use the different chemical agents to prepare the uh, you know chemically competent cells and how you can be able to use them for the transforming the uh, with the transformations. Uh, sub, uh, apart from that we have also discussed about the electroporations and uh, so with this, I would like to conclude our lecture here. In our subsequent lecture, we are going to discuss about the uh, DNA delivery into the mammalian cells. Thank you.